Okay, good. So today we are starting the second part of the course, okay, where we uh, will relearn from, from scratch or from a different perspective uh, how to build a web application using uh, one of the most popular frameworks uh, that is out there, in particular React. We already knew that. And you may wonder why we spend some time in creating uh, web applications by hand uh, with the DOM and JavaScript, uh, so all the work that we did last week. Okay. We well, basically wanted you to have a good uh, uh, knowledge of the JavaScript language, and we also wanted you to feel the pain uh, in developing uh, uh, web applications uh, at the DOM level, so where everything we did something very simple in the classroom, but in the lab you had, you had to fight in order to put all the functionalities together, okay? And so, uh, the, the, the issue is that uh, we, you have a very low level, let's say, view over the page, and that to handle all the events individually and uh, decide where to store the data, when to update some part of the page, how to create a, a given HTML fragment, and so on, okay? So it's, uh, it's a very you know, heavy uh, type of programming. Uh, that's the reason why uh, many frameworks uh, uh, were developed uh, that could help uh, the user uh, work uh, on the front end. And in particular, we, we, are, we are going to learn uh, um, React, which uh, by far is one of the most popular ones uh, uh, in these years. Hmm? Um, the, Documentation or, or information about React is available at this website, react.dev, that was uh, changed and redesigned just uh, three, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, uh, because before there was a, a totally different uh, documentation website uh, that dated back to maybe four or five years. Then in, in the meantime, the framework has evolved, and so some programming patterns also evolved. And right now we have the, you know, the, first, uh, uh, say the first weeks in which the new documentation is available. It's much clearer, uh, but probably sometimes you can also find some reference to the old website that was called uh, reactjs.org. Okay, that doesn't exist anymore. It goes to react.dev, and uh, as we see from the GitHub page uh, address, uh, uh, React is a library developed by a group of people. It's an open source product, but it's developed by a, people, uh, a group of people at Facebook. Hmm? Uh, Meta now. Okay. Uh, so this is the React Dev web page, where we find uh, all the uh, basic information uh, divided into learn and a, and a reference. So some learn, uh, learning paths, so basic tutorials or something which is more, uh, say, in-depth. And, uh, of course, the API reference uh, where all the main functions and the components and so on are, are described. Hmm? Um, we learn uh, the, the main part here. So why do we need uh, or do we want or do we choose, basically, to use a framework? Well, basically to simplify our lives uh, and to you know, exploit <coughs> common solutions to common problems, okay? We don't have to reinvent every time the problem of uh, uh, registering event handlers and what happens when you do, well, disable or enable an event handler or you want to change some part of the page and so on. Uh, uh, we have to write uh, many times similar types of code uh, with a framework. Uh, uh, the basic functionality that every web application needs uh, are already you know, implemented in the library. What we are losing, we are losing uh, uh, our freedom of design. So we need to follow the rules of the framework. We can just declare the variable we want and use it, update it and modify it when we want it and how we want it. We can do everything, but we need to follow the rules of the framework, which are not just the rules of the language. Of course, we must use the language correctly. But on top of that, the framework works well if you use uh, its own uh, some functionalities in the correct way. Okay, so there are some rules to follow, and some of these rules may not be intuitive at first. Uh, so we need to, to learn uh, 
to program in a slightly different way. Uh, up to now, we always worked uh, explicitly in a um, nearly sequential way. We decide what to do and we do it right away. Okay? We capture an event and then we have an event handler that does something with the DOM in that moment. Oh, okay, it will be scheduled in the future, but for, from our point of view, we are expressing the operations and the modifications that we want to apply. Uh, with React, uh, we, we need to describe you know, the modification in a different way, and it's framework that will apply the modifications. We only give the instruction on how to do that. Hmm? So we need to take a step back, and uh, uh, the advantage, of course, is that we are going to work uh, at a higher level, so we don't have to care about a lot of lower stuff uh, or details. Um, <laughs> in, in particular, one uh, of the main aspects uh, that, well, every framework uh, implements in a different way, and so they are fighting with each other, is uh, the management of state. Okay? If you have a static page, a static application, okay, HTML is fine. The problem comes when this application contains some data, and this data must evolve over time. So where do we want to store the state? In, when, in which place? How, if the state changes, the state information changes, uh, which are the user interface elements that should be changed also? They should react to this change and so on. Okay? So the, the way in which we manage the state is very uh, specific uh, in, uh, in, in every framework, and in particular we'll see the, the React way. Hmm? As I mentioned, the main resources come from documentation that is really <coughs> clear and full of, full of examples, okay? So it's a big improvement over the version that we had before. And, uh, um, and sometimes it also gives you some directions, some suggestions, so how to use some functionality. It's not just a description of how it works, uh, but it will tell you, well, try to avoid this pattern because they learn from you know, uh, thousands of developers that were using React and some, function, some functionality were not clear at the beginning and maybe people started using it in the wrong way. And right now in the current documentation, we also have this kind of uh, explanation and kind of help. Um, one very useful tool that we have also when we develop uh, in React is to install a small extension for the browser, Chrome or Firefox, uh, what you prefer, uh, that is called the React Developer Tools. So we'll add some, well, a couple of tabs uh, to our developer uh, console uh, that we'll, we will use to uh, inspect uh, um, our application at the level in which we are programming that. Of course, a web page is uh, HTML, is DOM nodes. But we are designing it in terms of components. And we'll learn today what they mean. Uh, in React components. So the developer tools uh, is able to, let's say, reverse engineering the content of the page and show me the components uh, that it designed instead of the HTML that was generated. So we can debug in a way, uh, or at least inspect the code uh, at the level in which uh, I've written it. Hmm? So uh, you, yeah, we are suggesting you to, to install either of these add-on depending on your preferred browser. So, what are the principles uh, behind uh, React? Uh, a React developer practically never sees the DOM. We learn what the DOM is. We learn to create and uh, to query and to change the properties. Okay, right, uh, right away we may nearly forget about it. And uh, uh, because the DOM will be managed directly by the React library and not by ourselves. Okay. Um, so, I don't need uh, to manipulate directly DOM nodes. I don't need uh, to schedule carefully the operations. I don't know, I show, I'm showing an error message, I need to decide when, when it goes away, and uh, if the submit button is pressed before the cancel button, should I delete it or not? So there's a lot of uh, timing issue in every uh, uh, web page. And so we to be careful about uh, the order in which we are doing some operation. In React, uh, we should leave uh, every 
timing issue and every update operation in the hands of the framework. The framework will update when it's needed. We'll update the content when it's needed. We don't need to schedule, why not do this before that? I just need to declare what I need. So basically, we create, a, we see the page, a page as a set of components. A component is a part of the page that knows only how to do one thing, to render itself, to display itself. So I say, okay, this page is made of four components. Every component has a rule, as the code for displaying itself into HTML code. And then when this component is called, is rendered by using the, the terminology of React, uh, is something that is decided by the framework. Okay? Uh, a component basically is a function. Hmm? It's a function that is called by React uh, when it wants. We have no control over when our functions are called. We declare a bunch, a bunch of functions, we declare how they relate to each other, of course, but then the calling of this function is not ours. Okay? Um, and it would be the library that knows when some condition, some data maybe has changed, and so it needs to update a part of the page. It will call the function that recreates that part of the page, and will then update the page itself. The only thing we should provide is uh, how to update, not, no, not even after that, how to create a part of the page. To create it the first time or to create it after an update. It should be the same. For me, uh, for a component, uh, its duty is uh, create a part of a page. Maybe by using other components but by delegating to other components some smaller parts uh, of, the same, of the same component. Okay? Um, it will be done basically by defining a set of functions that are calling each other. We are creating a sort of a shadow or virtual DOM, so we are not creating a real web page. Our functions are creating some sort of a uh, um, invisible web page that will then be applied uh, to the real DOM by the browser itself, by the uh, uh, React library itself. We'll see this in more detail. And, uh, but this is something that we are only, <laughs> we'll tackle uh, next week. Uh, there are, on top of this component functional design approach, uh, there, are, there will be some specific uh, state management uh, uh, functionalities, okay? So, what, what does it mean that we have a functional approach? Okay, we are trying, we, we, need, we know something you know, about the functional operator map, uh, filter, and so on, that uh, uh, tend to get some input and return an output uh, with, uh, with no side effects, okay? Uh, in React, we are defining the user interface as a set of functions that we call components. And a function generates a component, a React component, it's a function that generates a fragment of the user interface. A div and its contents, a table and its contents, the navigation bar, the side menu, whatever. Any part of the page can be called a component as long as we define one function that will create that part of the page. Create the HTML code, probably, or something more sophisticated. These functions can be static functions, static in the sense that they, always, they, may always, they could always return the same value. I don't know, the side footer is always the same. So the function will always return the same part of the same fragment. Okay. Or they normally have parameters. Huh? In the navigation bar, maybe I have information about the logged in user. So I need to show the avatar, I need to show the name, the login state. And so it will, the, that part of the page that will be generated by a component, by a function, depends on some other information. 
that is pro that is provided to this function by its arguments. Arguments are, uh, to this function that are called uh, properties in React or props. Okay, so uh, this function always have one object as an argument, uh, which normally we call the props object, the properties object. And this object may have many, uh, it's a JavaScript object, uh, that may have many sub properties props.title, props.user, props.login, or whatever, that are the information that uh, the function can use uh, to customize the framework of the user interface. The first rule is that uh, if I call the same function, the same component, a second time with the same value of the props, uh, the function must return the same HTML fragment. I can, I, no, the function should never mutate any of the data that it receives, and it should be, it then potent means that I'm calling it many times with the same parameters, I always get the same result. So this means that the function itself inside doesn't create any side effect, and doesn't access any external information. So this is the first basic rule. So in this case, React is free to call the function one, two, 20 times, as many times as it needed, according to its own logics. So maybe one part of the page is not displayed in the browser, there's no need of calling this function. Whether I call it or not, cannot, cannot affect anything else, because the function doesn't have any side effect. And if I call it at the beginning or after a while or I call it three times because the user maybe is resizing the page, never mind. The, because the result of the function will always be the same. Hmm? This is for simple functions that are pure function. A function whose output only depends on its input. And these inputs are only just uh, one object called the properties. Then <clears throat> there's an extension of this concept where some components, not all of them, we don't need for, for all of the components, but some of the components uh, may have some internal state to manage. So for example, we say the, uh, the user is logged in or not. Okay, this is an information that should be remembered by the application. It should be stored somewhere. Storing this information that may affect uh, all the components in the page probably, uh, should be done in one component that owns this information, that remembers it from the other, for the others, and then will propagate it to the others. So some components will have also some state information. This, Slightly generalizes the rule, but let's say that the, the output of the function only depends on these parameters, okay, and its internal state. It's still a pure function because if I call it many times without changing the parameters and without changing the state, the result will be the same. So inside the, the execution of a function, we should consider always the state and the properties as immutable constants. Of course, properties are input parameters. It's easy to consider them to be immutable, to be constant. The state is something that we want to evolve, of course, because <laughs> it wouldn't be a state if it didn't change. But during the execution of a component code, it should be treated as a constant. And then there are special calls, special methods for scheduling a change of the state. So we are never changing the state. We are scheduling a future update of, the, of that. That will be outside the execution of the component. So React tries very hardly to maintain a pure functional view in the execution of the components and a sequential view on the update of the state. That are totally separated. We should no, buy in this kind of separation. And uh, uh, the fact that uh, we are all these requirements, uh, functions uh, should be pure 
the parameters should be mutable and the results should be mutable and so on and the state uh, can be modified but not directly can only be changed through special calls uh, that do it in a perfected way you cannot just change a variable you tell react that they're going to change it variable and so react can update or call again all the components that depend on the state all the dependency value dependencies are handled by react and so we need to inform the library when we want to change something mm -hmm. so we are working in this you know, more rigid way because the, bra the, the framework is doing uh, all the work for us and so the framework knows when a function needs to be called because it needs to be called when the props change when the state changes or maybe other reasons you know user scrolling window resizing or whatever okay and this function can be called many times what is surprising at the beginning is that uh, uh, a component will recreate uh, its own fragment of the page from zero every time even if you, I'm only changing the color of the icon very simple thing or even if I don't change anything because maybe the properties change but the kind of change that we have there doesn't affect the rendering the display of that component but nevertheless in this functional approach the function is executed from the beginning and will give me the full result um, this could be a problem in performance okay but I, I every time I click somewhere I'm rebuilding the whole page this should be slow actually it isn't for two reasons one react is quite clever in which components uh, in understanding which components need to be refreshed re-rendered but second the cost of updating web page is actually the cost of updating the DOM nodes because every time you touch a DOM node, it will, uh, the, the browser itself will have to rearrange all the rendering. Do a lot of work at the layout level. So what React does is that it will store our um, result, our component, the results of our functions, the user interface fragment, in, not into the real DOM, but into a virtual DOM. That is just a JavaScript data structure, very light. So every time we are returning, we are executing a component, we create a fragment of the virtual DOM, not the real one. That's quite, that's quite easy. Okay. It doesn't slow, it's not, it's not low, slow at all. And then it has an optimized algorithm to measure the differences between the DOM currently displayed on screen and the virtual DOM that has just been computed by the components. And it checks the differences and only applies surgically those points that are actually changed to those nodes uh, that are, are actually being created, destroyed, or modified. So we are recreating the whole page in the virtual DOM. React will make a diff of the current virtual DOM with the current real DOM and we'll selectively update only those few nodes that need to be changed. This is transparent to us. And the page is updated. So the actual performance depends on how many nodes we really change. If we recreate a page that is 99% equal to the previous one, then only 10% of the, or 1% of the nodes will really be updated. So we shouldn't be worried about recreating from scratch uh, all the components it, it, it's a bit of the, the the functional mentality the functional programming mentality every function should return a new value a new copy of a value you should never modify a value everything is immutable in react don't be scared don't try to save uh, some microseconds uh, because okay but i'm creating a copy of an array should i try to modify reuse it uh, no okay no because then it will become difficult to handle by the by a framework in an asynchronous way 
if you are modifying the values uh, under the hood. Always make copies, and the frameworks will manage them. Hmm? And uh, also some uh, uh, events are simplified according to the DOM, uh, so the virtual DOM is easier to see, easier to program than the real DOM. Hmm? Uh, but these are just details. The, the, main pro the main issue is that uh, we have these three steps. First, we call the components to render themselves. All these renderings are going to a virtual version of the page, the DOM, and then this, the final update step that really updates the page. And okay, if you are curious, there are some uh, also documentation about the, the actual algorithm that is being used. And we'll see in a, in a couple of places we need to help the algorithm. Because in general, you know that tree comparison is an algorithmically hard problem, in general, okay? Uh, but here, we are in a very special case where you don't have many types of nodes, and many of them will uh, conserve the same IDs, uh, and the only problem are when we have some lists of nodes of, uh, uh, of sequences of, objects, of identical objects where we should give a little help to the algorithm in doing the right thing efficiently. But apart from that, the, the, this difference is quite um, efficient. Hmm? Okay, so how do we integrate this framework into our code? Uh, this is what uh, will be present in the main page of our application. Usually we don't write it because it's already in the template. But just understand that um, imagine you have a one DOM element, for example, an empty div. Okay, so this is a normal uh, get element by D that gives me an element in my page. So first of all, React will attach, will manage the content of a single node. Could be body could be a div inside the body, could be just one part of the page, wherever you want. So the React library will manage one part of our web, or our web page starting from a given root node. This root node should be initially empty, usually, and what you do is to um, render the application inside the root element. This root element is a React node created starting from the container node. So this container is a DOM node, this root is a React element. And this is a description of a, of a fragment of HTML or actually it's a fragment of React elements. So what we are doing is uh, we are we have an empty page, basically, with an empty element, and we are attaching to that empty element uh, one React component. And we are telling with this render call. And what we are saying is that, please render this component, so call the function corresponding to that component and see what virtual DOM it will create. And uh, render, mount, display the result of this component inside this root element. And of course, that component will not just be a hello world. It will be probably a component that contains other components and so on. It will create a whole page. Uh, in, uh, um, in React, uh, we see a little a strange syntax here. Okay, what we see here is a bit strange. You, you, could, you should let me, but aren't there some quotes missing? So, how can you write HTML inside JavaScript? Actually, it's not HTML. It's an extension of JavaScript called the JSX that looks like HTML, but is uh, translated into valid JavaScript. So this is the kind of translation of uh, what we are writing here into the real JavaScript code. So for example, we write here div, and it will be translated into 
a call of a div, div function inside the React library. And the div has a property ID equal to test, and so there are some objects with all the properties. And this has two children, and so we have uh, the list of children. The first child is in each one that is translated into a function that will create uh, the component, uh, a component representing the each one. With its uh, um, children, oh, sorry, with its uh, properties, we don't have any properties, and its children, in this case, just a text. So creating a, a tree of components, of nested components, is actually something like this. Creating a set of uh, functions uh, that will create a component with the given properties, with given children, and so on. But this would be very readable, very difficult to follow. So they invented the simplified syntax that looks like HTML. And it's very convenient. I want to create some nodes that correspond to this fragment, to this HTML fragment. Just so we can mix, in a way, huh, HTML syntax, or well, really, JSX syntax, with JavaScript code. The environment, uh, you can do that normally in, a, you know, in any JavaScript file. Of course, the compiler should be you know, uh, instructed to do this translation in an invisible way for us. But we can mix and match uh, as we want. So we just remember that all of this that we write here is an expression. It's a JavaScript ex expression that creates some object. So it may happen whenever we have an expression in every part of the code. In which, so we can store it into a variable. We can, we can pass it up as a parameter. We can return it from function and so on. It's an expression that returns an object corresponding to some React element. So we get used to that. Hmm? Uh, as without any expression, let's just think that this is a tag that is opening a parenthesis in an expression, and the closing tag will close that parenthesis of the same expression. So all the tags should be balanced. It's not just a string. The tags should be properly nested. But we'll see the details of, of, um, of um, JSX, uh, more details later. So we want to reason a page as a set of components. So let's try to think how we design a page. Imagine a page like this. Uh, you can divide it into different sections and create uh, one section, one component, sorry, for rendering each of the sections. And of course, we have maybe the right sidebar, which is a component with some properties, with some layout, with some CSS styles for its width and height, and contains two other components. So we can create a function for describing this component, a function for describing this component, a function for describing the other one. There are three different components. Of course, the sidebar component will include the other component, a call to the other components. OK? And so for the left part of the page, we have maybe the main content, any several components of type a blog post. Then this blog post, maybe they are just text, or maybe they have an image preview. It can be the same component that behaves in different ways according to the data that is provided. So we have a sort of a blog container that contains a list of blog post components. So we should see our page as a nesting of components, of, of blocks, a proper nesting. And then we can build each of these components and mount the topmost component, the external one, into the real web page. Okay, the create route according to the 
first component. And all the rest will follow. Okay? Normally, we have a, a one component, the, the topmost component is called app, is our application. So uh, in the template of the project, we already have one app component, uh, and uh, uh, we just uh, implement the body of this app component by calling, by including other components that we define by ourselves. And so we're taking over the content of the web page. The HTML will be empty at the beginning, and then the uh, execution of the components code will create it uh, um, piece by piece. And uh, 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 components are just functions. Functions that may or may not receive some parameters, some properties, and should return a fragment of a virtual DOM, of JSX. We use JSX to create this no virtual DOM nodes. If the function <coughs> has no parameters, of course, it will return me a constant fragment. If the function has some parameters, of course, we can create some fragment that depends on the properties. So we have some extra syntax uh, for inserting a JavaScript ex uh, ex uh, expression into a JSX, some JSX code. Just to say that the return, the resulting value of the function will be always the same if the props are the same, but maybe different if the props are different. So inside here, we are building something that depends on the properties. Inside this, we may have div, h1, p, and so on, which are React components corresponding one-to-one -to, -one to HTML nodes, element types. Or we can have uh, the, any other React component uh, that we define or that we find in some library. Okay, we have that DOM or React components here in the JSX. Normally, we have some two, fami two families of components, uh, but it's not a rigid rule, uh, it's just a, a design uh, suggestion. Some components that really create portions of, of the page and some components that only manage the information about the other components. Okay, we try to tend to separate those that have more to do with the layout and those that have more to do with the data acquisition or data um, update. But this will be for next week. Um, Okay, the last concept, then we go to something practical. A component receives properties, okay? And it can render itself uh, according to these properties. Where, um, where does it receive the properties from? From another component that calls it. So a component calls another component by and is able to pass some properties down to that component. And this component, in turn, can pass a subset of its properties to its own children and so on. So we have a tree of components starting from the top level application to the different components or so different parts of the page, where we always have a top to down flow of properties. Properties can only flow top down. It's a consequence of the functional approach. It's a tree, so it cannot call back anything which is uh, higher than you. you. Cannot close the cycle. You cannot create a graph, and you cannot modify properties that you receive. They are all immutable, and so information can only flow from the root of the application to the leaves of the application, which is okay because normally all the main, all the, all the important information is known by the top-level nodes, and only that, that 
portion, those portions of information that we need are given to some of the subcomponents. Uh, what we see, and it's not a surprise, that uh, we cannot just, uh, as properties, use uh, values. No? We can pass some values, some strings, some objects uh, down to the component. We can also pass functions. Okay, so in the top-down information flow, we are passing properties. These properties may be objects, or strings, or values, or functions. And passing a function is a way of uh, letting a component below to call a function that I defined in my component. So it's a way of uh, sharing a callback where the low-level component, the nested component, can access some information or some action of the top-level component. So we need to uh, learn a bit uh, this kind of behavior. And in addition to that, we have the state, which is something which is, that is owned by only one component and can be shared by copying through down the uh, top-down uh, property tree. So we have a very rigid uh, way of uh, handling information. Uh, the list of, uh, we have a list of items, a list of, of answers, okay, in our example, to display. There is one component that owns the list. It contains some state variable that contains the list. But it's not a component that will display the list, the table itself. Another component will display the table. So uh, the content of this list will be copied to the component or to its container, or to, to the component that you will create the table, and to the component that will create each row of the table. We are passing part of this information. And so uh, React will call and render this information from the state to the view here. Yeah. One component is a state, and the, the, the knowledge of the state, of every change of the state, will update the view thanks to this component tree. We are passing a state to the component, the property, and so on. Of course, we should also have some mechanism for updating the state that goes through some actions, some event tenders that are in the list components uh, that will and will have the opportunity of uh, updating the state. For today, we only focus on this first uh, creation of the page. Next week, uh, we'll uh, see uh, how to make it live, how to make the state uh, um, evolve. Okay, so how to start? Um, of course, there will be a library to, to import. And, you know, only these three lines will be enough to start uh, a React application. The problem is that if, if you write this, it will not compile, uh, uh, basically because the JSX syntax is not understandable by the browser directly. Uh, so what we uh, usually do uh, it will have a project configuration which the code that we write will be compiled and transformed. For example, there is a component, there is a library called Babel that will transpile, so transform from JSX to JavaScript. And so then, the, the, then the browser will be able to read it eh, and to process it. So even if the concept is simple of, of, of React, we just mount and render one node. Uh, we need to set up the compile the environment in which, uh, uh, by which everything should be compiled into plain JavaScript that can be sent to the browser. So we are writing code in a very organized way with many components, but after all, all of these components will be put together into one big uh, JavaScript bundle file and we send to the browser after all the transformations. Setting up all the, you know, uh, all the options for managing this uh, uh, compilation is a bit complex and so usually we use uh, some extra tool for scaffolding the project, so for creating a skeleton of the project. Uh, there are several of these kind of tools. Uh, 
until last year, uh, the React team suggested one command that was called uh, create React app. Hmm? That will create a skeleton of a project. Uh, it looks like this tool is no longer supported, or at least it's no longer suggested. So its own team doesn't you know, suggest it. And so uh, we, we found this other alternative. There are many, but we, we, found, we try to find the, the simplest one, so, which is called Vite. And uh, <laughs> can create uh, projects of different types. It's a tool for creating the skeleton of a project using different libraries, where we, you will use different libraries. Okay? So in our case, uh, these are just the steps that we need to, to follow. So let's open in our, let's forget the exercise for later. Uh, Let's open a terminal here in week six, for example. And we want to create a new project uh, from scratch, a new simple project in React, our first uh, React project. So we call it first, maybe. Okay? This is the command npm create, vite like latest, which is the script that we'll use uh, for creating it. And then the name of my application first. npm create byte latest first. In week six, okay. So the first time we will ask you, do you want to download byte? Of course, you should. You must say yes, it didn't ask me here because I already used it in my computer. And it'll ask me what framework are you going to use? We are going to use React. And, uh, using JavaScript, uh, you can choose the first one or the third one. Uh, they say that uh, there are slightly different configuration. They say that the, the third one is uh, uh, a bit faster. I choose that. But for the programming point of view, there's no difference. Done. What does it mean done? It means that it created a, a folder first with the name of my project with some stuff inside. The skeleton of my project. And it will tell me how to work with that. Of course, uh, you must, I must move into the directory and install all the dependencies. The dependencies are, you, know, you already created a package of JSON with all the dependencies. You see, you, you, we don't have many of them. At the runtime, we only depend on the React library itself. At development time, we depend also on some scripts and plugins that are installed by Vite that we ha will handle all the compilation, all the live updates, and so all the serving of the, of the application, and so on. But these are only developer dependencies, something that we use during development mode, and then we, we see the product, uh, uh, the only dependency for the moment, uh, are just the right library itself. So we can install. And we'll download some stuff, uh, some Thanks of megabytes. What's the problem? There's some oops. No, makes you very sure. No. Interesting because I tried it yesterday evening and it worked. Huh? Do you get the same error as I do? Good. So let's try. So 
first two and try to select this other. Okay, this is working. Uh, so let's try to select the other option title without the SWC. You see, installed, it is totally different. Uh, um, so, first, uh, second. It uses a diff some different uh, uh, di ways of compiling that use uh, the um, SW SWC library is an alternative to Babel. Babel is the transpiler. It's faster, but seems that today is not working. Okay. Anyway, if, if it's not stable, we'll move to the first one. From the development point of view, nothing changes. It's only you see that uh, the, the, the real libraries are the same. And uh, of course, uh, it installs something different. It installs something to load modules, but we don't need to, to care about that. Of course, it will download uh, 82 packages. Uh, OK, good for you. And I can start the React application. So what is a React application? It's JavaScript. So we should have an HTML page that calls a JavaScript script that is opened by a browser. Uh, the browser should open something on a web server. We don't have a web server to publish our application. But Byte uh, has a a small web server embedded into development uh, uh, tools, uh, development scripts. So by run, in the run dev, run in development mode, we are starting a local web server with our application. Oh, right now it's not yet our application, the application that we show here. So it's telling me that, okay, we started your application, it's running on this web page, and you can visit uh, this page at this address. So maybe I just need to click, control click, and uh, is it open? Okay, oh, sorry, it's over many times. It was loaded the first time. Sorry. Okay, so I'm running, I'm opening this page onto localhost at this strange port number. And this is our, already our application, one application, which is where? So what is the organization of the files here? Okay, this is summarizing the this slide, but we'll, uh, we'll browse it uh, directly on the code. So this is our project directory, first number two. You see that it's a website, so it will start with an index.html. The index.html is practically empty. It's all this, but it will contain uh, load one script, which is a main JavaScript code. You see the extension JSX because we are using this JSX syntax extension, not just plain JavaScript. So we have an empty component in the body. We have an empty, an empty node root, and we are calling one JavaScript file. An empty HTML page that runs, contains only one empty div and one script. So all the work will go inside the script, main.jsx. That is included into the source directory. So we usually don't need to touch the index.html unless we want to change the, the icon, uh, you know, the, the five icon or something like that. Otherwise, or the title of the page, just minimal stuff. Otherwise, we leave, we leave it alone. Main.js is the real the first starting point where the React application is mounted into the page. It contains the render 
and the create root calls that we show in the slide. Again, it doesn't do anything until intelligent, it just locates the root element, the empty div, and mounts uh, the app component in a special strict mode with we basically there's a lot of extra checks in, on our code at the runtime for, uh, to, uh, to ensure that we are following the React rules. But basically it's mounting the app component into the root container. Plus it can, may apply some side sheets here. Again, you, we normally don't need to modify this file. But uh, from app we can work. App is our top level component in the page. And you see that, well, it's already contained something, but the syntax is very simple. Function, name of the component, and then return content of the page. That's it. Right now, this content is only calling, you know, or using divs uh, a and so that it's not using any other components if we want to develop our own application we can just modify this and uh, implement our code um, and, and we usually do um, in uh, we divide the uh, um, web server we have a nice uh, feature that the page, the application, is automatically updated whenever we change uh, anything. In it. So it's recompiled and updated in real time. So it's very convenient for, for debugging. So for example, if we change something, I don't know, not by, uh, in this string, by.react, plus react, say, modified. No, not sorry, modified like that. It, when, whenever I save this file, uh, it was very quick, but it uh, divided, uh, um, detected a modification of one file, recompiled everything, sent everything to the browser, which was connected, and the modification is visible in real time. So it's very useful to, to work uh, in, the, in development mode. Okay, you always keep this uh, open, you edit, you don't need to stop and restart uh, the web server when you are working. Hmm? Sometimes it gets dis disconnected and so you just have to re refresh the browser, depending on what kind of modification. If you are moving files around too much, uh, maybe it loses track. But so we're still inside our Visual Studio code and we are still uh, able to edit, edit and the application will update, uh, say, instantly. So if we do something else, maybe we can, uh, you know, something very... Hmm? So we have uh, a simple application, we can, we can also maybe return one, one fragment uh, that contains uh, a title, And then second message. Okay, like this. We can uh, drop everything we need, we don't need. 